start the recording. One of the um, sort of good effects of having our events online, of course, is that we get people attending from all over the country and, yes. and indeed from abroad. Mm. So obviously, if we invite people to a, an event in Berlin, it's people from Berlin and possibly from Potsdam or something who attend. But now we get people from all over the place. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. One of the few bonuses in the year, perhaps, that it's so much easier to connect with yeah. different people. and. The fact that we've all been sort of forced to embrace this technology is just quite interesting in the legacy it will leave in that, you know, I'm sure a lot of air miles will be saved and um, a lot of traffic that, you know, perhaps would have done before. And I think there's both good and bad in that. I mean, I really miss having meetings where I see people and you could network, but equally I don't miss spending so long on the road. <laughs> Right, what have we have? No, it's just, just six o'clock now, so we'll, we'll wait another few moments. What's the weather been like in Berlin today? It's been absolutely bitterly cold here. Same no snow, there. but if you like looking at the sky, you'd have thought Same it wanted to, there. and yeah. you certainly needed your coat on. <laughs> it's been really cold, yes. And I think we had like one one sunny day this week, and mm. apart from that, all the other days felt very grey and dark. Yes. And does it mean that you've not been able to put up all the Christmas markets and things that you normally would, or yeah? No, no Christmas markets. No Christmas markets. All the restrictions have stopped about the same over here. They, they do have a few sort of stalls where you can get, um, I don't know wine or cake or something but they're thinking of closing them down mm. yeah such a shame yeah. yeah so we have a good good number of people now should we start or do you want to wait a couple more now six oh one on, on my watch so perhaps we'll, we'll wait just another another okay. minute because it's usually people <laughs> coming in, so we'll just wait another, another minute and then we'll get started. Right, it seems to have stabilised now, yeah. Right. Well, wh why don't we get started? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Rupert Strachwitz um, and I'm very happy to welcome you to tonight's um, event of the German British Association. Special welcome. Um, this has become sort of routine now to um, our uh, members and guests, of course, but especially to uh, members of the other German British Associations all around the country who now have the chance to um, come in and join us for these events. And obviously um, to um, people from abroad as well, who are very happy to have you here. Um, online if, as obviously we can't uh, meet up in, in person. Um, as you may have seen in the invitation, we've experimented a bit again by not asking you to register, by just sending you the um, uh, link uh, with the invitation. And we just want to see whether this works. Other, other um, organizations are doing the same thing. We're all in, the, in a learning process to see how we can best organize these kind of um, events. But it seems to be working out quite well, if, I can, if I'm correct. Um, this event, as previous events um, uh, have been, will also be recorded. Um, and our speakers kindly permitted us to put it up on our website afterwards so that you can um, then um, uh, view it. You are invited, of course, to join in with questions and comments. And please use the chat. Um, function, um, which you can see at the bottom of your screen, um, if you want to come in. Now, special welcome to David Green, who is tonight's uh, speaker. Thank you very much for doing this. 
David Green is the director of the Florence Nightingale Museum, and who could be better suited um, to talk about Florence Nightingale than um, somebody who is actually concerned with and, and occupied with the memory of her um, full time, so to speak. Um, Florence Nightingale, um, of course, is a most remarkable uh, personality, and she has a little known connection to Germany, which we'll surely hear about um, in a moment. Um, uh, David Green um, uh, has been with the museum for, for three years, so he, he can really sort of delve into the whole uh, history of this remarkable personality and tell us more um, about her. Um, she is known as the lady with the lamp, but there's a lot more to her than just that. And to hear more, I now turn it over to David. The floor is yours. Thank you. Right. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's very, um, it's a real shame that I'm not actually with you out in Germany. It's one of my favourite countries to visit, um, Berlin in particular. But it's lovely that we've been able to use technology to find a way of still holding this event, me sharing some of the story of Nightingale in this, what is a very special year as her bicentenary. And um, particular thanks to Mari for all she's done to actually help set this evening up and the number of conversations we've had. So it's great to do that. I'll now attempt to share my screen with you so you can see some images, which will save you looking at me for the next 45 minutes and hopefully arise interest in various ways. So let's have a look. So there we go. Hopefully that means that you can all see the well. presentation there and um, away we go really. And please do feel free to drop those questions into the chat box and then we'll try and pick those up at the end and I will leave some time for doing that. So yes, my name's David Green. I'm the director at the Florence Nightingale Museum in London, a role I've held for about three and a half years now. Um, I'm a museum professional that has spent their entire life working um, in museums since graduating in history and um, that includes the world famous natural history museum working for organizations like the national trust but i was particularly attracted to this role because it was her bicentenary and the advert really did encourage to get somebody who would seize that and make as much of it as they can and I was really keen to do that because i clearly feel we owe a great gratitude to nightingale and to all nurses today as well. And I felt there was a real opportunity to look at both the historic and the contemporary too. And I'm a great believer in the fact that you use history to help inform the future and to actually in gener generate um, that real sense of pride, etc. cetera. Um, it's really fantastic, like I said, to be here and to have this opportunity and particularly because there is that really nice link with the Nightingale story and Germany itself, which we'll move on to. I don't know how much, um, not knowing who the audience is individually, um, how much you'll all know about um, Florence. So I will do this at quite a basic level in some ways, but we can always get to greater depth later on. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know about Nightingale is that she was actually from a very wealthy British family. Um, the family had made their money from lead up in the Derbyshire area and her father had been left the money on condition that he changed his name to Nightingale by the uncle that left it him. That was a bit of a no-brainer for him because it was a really substantial amount of money and he was somebody who led quite an unconventional life. Certainly religiously, he, he didn't follow the traditional routes, etc. And he wanted to be able to bring up his family according to his own values, his own beliefs, and making sure that they were educated in such a way that that was the case. And this was even before he had children, before he met his wife. And so he took the money and changed his name. And later on, he met Fanny Nightingale, Nightingale's mother, 
And when they married, they went off and did the grand tour of Europe, and particularly travelling through France, through Italy. Now, I think it says a lot about how wealthy the family actually were, that two daughters, both their children, were actually born while they were on honeymoon. And, you know, that's quite a length of time, if you think about it, to actually take place. But they were partly away, because... Whilst the family home was Lee Hurst up in Derbyshire, you can see a sketch of in the top corner there. Derbyshire, for those of you who visited, you'll probably nod and realise this. On a nice day, it's beautiful. But during the winter, very cold, very wet, and therefore it wasn't, he felt, where he wanted to spend the majority of his time and bring up his family. So they bought a second property, which actually dwarfs this one you see here and is much, much grander, much larger. And that was Embley Park um, down in Hampshire. So whilst that was being renovated, being expanded to be fitting for what he wanted to bring the family up, they went off on this tour. And Nightingale herself was born in the city of Florence, hence why she's got the name Florence Nightingale. Now, she was the second child. Her sister, Parthenope, was born in Naples, which is where her name comes from. And when they'd had this grand holiday and got back and got back and settled in Hampshire, he began to think about educating his daughters. And he was determined that they weren't going to have the standard British Victorian experience as girls, which would have really seen them only educating in how to run the house, making sure that they could do needlework, perhaps some artistry, painting, etc. But generally speaking, that would have been the extent of their education if it hadn't been for Peter. Peter instead set about teaching his girls pretty much everything that he knew himself. He decided not to appoint a governess, as would be typically the case, and took on the role of tutor for the majority of things. And this particularly included maths, numerous languages, etc., philosophy, all things that it's very untypical for a girl of that age to do. Now the picture in the top there shows the young ladies and certainly the Nightingales would have been considered to be quite a catch. Florence in particular, because she was regarded as being very beautiful, she was very tall, very slim, but really they would have been quite a catch for anyone because they were also wealthy. And of course, there were two daughters um, at the time, very unusual for girls, for ladies to inherit. It would generally have passed to the son, but there wasn't a son. So you'd got these two rich girls. It was expected they would marry and in doing so, increase the status of the family. And certainly Fanny Nightingale, Florence's mother, was really keen that that should happen because she was quite what we'd probably call a social climber. Now, Parthenope was very happy to follow the, the typical route of a Victorian lady, looked to get married, enjoyed her artwork and so on. But Florence really wasn't going to be that conventional. She decided from an early age that she, she had, you know, a higher thing to do. And just before her 17th birthday, she was sitting under a tree at Embley Park, this grand estate, and she felt that God spoke to her and said, I want you to do something special. Now, at that point, she wasn't sure what that would be, but she knew that it was something to do with working with people, helping the world, and that she was basically God's chosen person to actually lead some sort of initiative. She spoke to her parents about this, and they naturally thought she'll grow out of it. She's only 16, 17 years old. Hopefully this will change because we really need to protect the family reputation and her to follow the traditional route. And in fact, she had three different marriage proposals that we know about. There could have been more during the course of her life. And the top right hand corner there is the person who probably came closest. He's a politician, a journalist, and in that way had real status as to what would have been. And certainly her mother was very keen on that relationship. But Nightingale insisted that, in fact, she didn't want to get married because that would stop her fulfilling her destiny. Now, I'm sure a number of you have got children yourselves and when they were at the age of um, 16, 17, finishing school, didn't know what to do, 
perhaps you thought it would be a good idea that they went off traveling and actually discovered themselves a bit before committing settling down travel broadens the mind is an english phrase that um, we use i don't know whether that translates um, to german but certainly it's something that i'd very much encourage anyone to do because traveling really does inspire you in many different ways a nightingale you know set off on a travel she went round europe again and she went to Egypt. She's one of the first Western women to actually get to Egypt. And it's while she's in Egypt that God talks to her again. And she feels when she's at Abu Simbel at the time, um, God has now said to her, nursing is what I want you to do. And I want you to take on this profession. Now, the nursing profession didn't exist as what we know it today. In fact, it was thought to be very, very lowly and there weren't hospitals as such most areas that did nursing it was actually connected to some sort of convent or monastery in order that there was that religious aspect behind it nightingale truly believed that she was being talked to by god and that she should find a way to do this because she had to ask her family's permission which wasn't the modern values we have today where people can decide pretty much what they want to do she explained again to her family that she wanted to do this. And whilst her mother was having none of it, her father eventually listened and said he was really impressed by the study she'd been doing because she'd been amassing pamphlets, books, writing letters to people to really study because she was so determined. And this is where the best German connection to this story comes because Nightingale decided that the best place to go to study was Kaiserwerth, because she'd heard about this Lutheran institution, the deaconesses there were highly skilled, were writing up their findings in this you know, emerging career. And Florence felt that if there was anywhere she should learn, she should go to the best. And so that's where she heads for a three month period. Now, three months is quite a time, and she was there, she studied, wrote copious amounts of notes. And I think we all know them a huge amount of thanks, um, because it's thanks to that training that she received there, and she brought back and built upon with her own theories, that she actually really did enter the nursing profession. And she got her first job when she came back from there, working on world famous Harley Street, which to this day has a number of doctors, etc. But sadly, the place where she was working, the Hospital for Gentlewomen, which effectively looked after ladies who society had become a bit too much for. And she spent some time there as the matron. And that's what gave her her first role as a professional nurse. She was so happy, she actually says in her diary, she was as happy as the day is long that she'd had this opportunity. But sadly, the building isn't there anymore. But the bottom right hand picture, that's what's carved into the wall instead there, just marking the fact that this is where she was doing her very first work. And it's while she was there that the Crimean War broke out. Now, it was interesting because with the Crimean War, while she was traveling, she'd been to Italy and she'd met a politician called Sir Sidney Herbert and she'd become particular friends with his wife. Now, by chance, Herbert's political career had grown, his status had grown and he'd become the Minister of War. And I think it's fair to say that the Crimean War was going very, very badly. It had been hoped it would be a matter of weeks if not months and that Britain would work with their allies Turkey and France to defeat Russia and protect their trade routes whereas instead the war went on and on and on and Britain had made some quite bad decisions along the way in actually not getting its troops the support they needed. The politicians needed a good news story to be able to say to the press and so Herbert decided to contact his old friend Nightingale and say, I remember you're interested in nursing. I understand you're now working as a nurse in Harley Street. Could you possibly advise what we could do? Because we've got lots of troops being injured. We've got all sorts of problems. He did that and I think he was probably a little bit shocked that Nightingale's response was, great, I want to be involved. 
I will put together a team of nurses and head out to Turkey, which was where she was based in a place called Skatari Hospital. Now, Skatari Hospital was certainly not a hospital as we'd recognise today. Florence, it took a long time to get there. She was seasick. And when she arrived, she was very run down. But then she was completely mortified to find the state of the place. The top left hand picture shows very much what she found. It's just a lithograph from the time. And actually the soldiers were lying along with their amputations, along with their injuries on the floor. There were no beds, um, there was no medication, and actually they were largely the forgotten people. And this was a source of huge embarrassment to the British government, because for the first time ever in the Crimean War, there were actually journalists on the ground alongside the soldiers. So news began to leak out to the um, people back home that this is the way the British politicians were treating these soldiers who'd gone out to defend the honour of the country. Nightingale, believe it or not, when she was arrived, was not welcomed by the army generals that were in charge, particularly John Hall, who was the doctor in charge. He saw it as no place for a woman. He saw it that what value could she add and therefore didn't ask her opinion, didn't ask her to get involved. And Nightingale had to be very careful. She knew that if she was going to win them over, she had to be invited to play a part. She couldn't just start straight away doing what she needed to do. Therefore, she said to the ladies she took with her, who were in the main nuns who'd shown an interest in nursing, but she knew therefore they'd be quite obedient and follow her instructions. We're not nursing at first, we're gonna work on the cleaning. And she turned the top left into the top right. She used her connections well to actually say to the politicians, I need beds, I need medication, I need blankets, I need cleaning materials. And she actually got the place cleaned up before she could actually get on with the real work she'd gone for. The hygiene was a major problem because there was a rat infestation, but worse still, there was even a dead horse within the water supply. And she realised that something was going on that was not quite right because she didn't understand germ theory at the time etc so she just wrote copious notes realizing that she would come back to that later because she wasn't allowed to actually converse with the soldiers that were injured during the day because she wasn't wanted there she began to walk around at night and she realized that one of the things that would actually help the troops get better was actually just be to treated with some decency and as well as the medication they needed and the cleansing, they needed mental stimulus. They needed someone to show that they actually cared whether they lived or died. And so she walked around at night, accompanied by a drummer boy that was her manservant. They would walk around and just check on the soldiers and actually would start administering some goodwill and thanks. And that straight away made her a heroine and very, very popular. Stories started to be written up in the London Illustrated News and the Times, the two big publications of the day, as to this woman walking around at night. How strange, how compassionate, and particularly because she was a lady of class, spoke well, intelligent, and it really did just make them feel special that someone cared. At that point, the Lady of the Lamp emerges as the story that you've probably heard of, etc., a lot of people don't realise that actually she wasn't on the war front in Russia. She was in Skatari in Turkey, but the work she was doing was very, very vital. She was known as being a very hard taskmaster and she wouldn't accept it at all if her ladies weren't giving their best. She had very strict rules. She sent several home for being drunk, for fraternising with other soldiers and the like. We've got this fantastic document in the museum that acts like a little bit of a school report where she writes her comments. And certainly she wasn't a lady to be messed with. She wasn't a person that was fluffy in her descriptions. She wanted the job done. She was determined. She was driven. And I think that's one of her great leadership qualities. 
She was so popular that when she returned after four years, making sure she's the last person to come back from there, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, designed what's um, commonly referred to as the Nightingale Jewel on the left. It was a special medal, effectively, that was awarded her for her work. And that had to happen because there wasn't a medal that could be awarded to a woman because none of us had really gone out in the capacity that she had. So this was an entirely new thing. She couldn't be given all the things that the soldiers who performed well out there could because there was no precedent for doing so. The story of the Crimea, of course, has become actually, you know, so famous and the thing we think of when we say Nightingale, to the extent that when I was a young lad a few years ago, Nightingale was actually on the back of one of our banknotes and celebrated in that way with a scene with her lamp, of course, from the Crimean War. Now, that note has been changed because obviously we change them all the time, but it's amazing to think that Florence was the person who was celebrated first as a woman in this way and was given that honour and it's taken a large number of years for a second woman to appear in that way, um, which is a real shame but it's happening now. I think in a way I really like this and we've got one on display in the museum and I love it because it is my first connection to Nightingale herself and you know to think that all these years later I now run her museum it's quite amazing that as a child if I was very lucky I used to get one of those for Christmas. <laughs> so Nightingale came back from the Crimean War she actually travels back um, in secret under the name Miss Smith because she's determined to not be recognised she hates the idea of publicity she just thought she was doing her job and what was all the fuss about. What she did do, though, was decide that the mistakes of the Crimean War could never happen again. It wasn't right for our soldiers to be treated that way, and it wasn't right for anybody to be suffering in the way that she saw um, out on the war front. She hated the idea, too, that their wives, their children who'd been left behind, had suffered due to poverty, due to perhaps not having that male influence around. And she really started to think, but the first thing she had to do was try and get some sort of recovery because she was ill herself. She contracted what we now believe to be a disease called brucellosis, caught off unpasteurized products. And for a long time, she battled illness and pretty much for the rest of her days, she'd have bouts where she had to return to bed. But what she realised she wanted to do was carry on that work. And again, she's um, feeling she's being guided by God. And she wants to establish the nursing profession. And you'll remember that when I spoke earlier, I said that Free Nightingale was very much driven by religious orders, by nuns often and the like. Whereas Nightingale wants to make it truly secular, believing that priests can look after people's soul but actually people should just look after the body and not worry so much about that. Now that's a real step change. And to illustrate just how much it was, the picture I've got on the top left there is of a character, Charles Dickens, I'm sure you may have heard of, the great writer. He had the name Mrs. Gamp, who was described as being more fond of her gin than the people that she looked after. And that was typically what people thought of when they said nurses in Britain prior to Nightingale. So Nightingale starts to think, what can I do to transform nursing? And the first thing, or one of the first things she does is write the book, Notes on Nursing. And it's interesting because it isn't aimed at professional nurses. It's actually aimed at women who are nursing in the home because she recognises that when somebody's ill, it's usually the mom, the gran, the eldest daughter who will look after them. So it's actually written in very simple English. It was a bestseller in her own time. It's still a bestseller today. It's been translated into well over 30 different languages. It's available throughout the world. We sell it hundreds of copies through our museum shop, I'm pleased to say. She also wrote underneath it notes on hospitals because she starts to think what was wrong with Scutari? It was dirty. It was cramped. And she starts to think what would be most useful. And of course, it's in notes on nursing where she actually writes how important it is that people wash their hands, which is quite interesting when you think the advice we were all given regarding the pandemic. 
She also is really interested in hospital design. So as well as writing that book, she works with um, architects to design St. Thomas's Hospital, which is now one of the best and well-known hospitals in the world. And she thinks, what can I do to actually further nursing more? Now, some money had been donated during the Crimean War to look after the soldiers. And at the end of the war, people said, well, give it to Florence, just give it to her as a thank you. That's how much the nation loved her. She's probably the second most famous woman in Britain at the time behind Queen Victoria. And dare I say it, she's probably the most loved. People really were obsessed with her. She didn't want the money, she didn't need the money. Remember, she's from a wealthy family. So instead, she sets up the nursing school and the first secular nursing school at St. Thomas's Hospital. And it's a brilliant idea that she has, because what she wants to do is make it that as the nurses actually progress and learn the role, they then go off and establish their own nursing schools. So in that way, organically, it spreads very quickly throughout the world, certainly following the roots of the British Empire. But by 1900, there's even a Nightingale nursing school in Japan. And I can testify how much they love her in Japan, because I was there last year. And... I gave somebody one of my business cards just to write my phone number on it. And they were absolutely made up. And he said, my wife's a nurse. She will cherish this, which was one of my fondest memories of the trip. I think what Nightingale really did bring to nursing was the idea of research as well. And statistics were always important. The bottom left-hand corner was an article that she wrote in order that she could convince the politicians to look after soldiers more who were working out in India. She loved statistics and she believed that they were God's way of talking to her and actually guiding her to some of the right solutions. But she realised if she was going to win over the politicians or browbeat them enough in order that they actually listened to her and made the public health improvements that she wanted, she'd got to do it quickly. They were never going to read long, long letters. And you notice at the start of her career, she tries the long letter and pamphlet approach. She abandons it. And instead, she starts sending them infographics. It's sometimes said that Florence invented the pie chart, which isn't true. But she was certainly, along with William Farr, at the forefront of using infographics for debates. And I think her other big thing that she achieved in nursing is she starts working with the poor a lot and actually developing district nursing so that people can actually be treated at home or in the poor houses. And in Britain, of course, we have the National Health Service. And whilst it would be wrong to say that Nightingale actually started the National Health Service, because of course she didn't, it didn't start till 1944. But actually, what she did do was advocate for free universal health care of the highest standards possible, which is the basic principle that remains there today. In that way, I think it's really important that we think at this point that Nightingale's nursing has moved on from the hands-on approach to actually being a fantastic manager, a great leader, a person that will design the best systems and use their influence. And that's something that largely she did from her bed, because remember, she came back, she was ill, but determined to work, and she'd still be working 20 hours a day. Non-nursing, Nightingale, you know, is so much more than a nurse, even though she is probably the world's most famous nurse. She certainly had that huge interest in engineering from the point of view of making sure that it benefited public health. So we've got a lot of documents that show her work on town planning in trying to particularly sort out the problems with London's water system, recognising Scutari, by now it was clear that dead horse in the well had been causing problems and so get back to London, you look at the Thames, it was known at the time as the Great Stink, it smelt so much, there was so much debris in it and so she worked with people to make sure clean water got out even to the slum areas in East London. She had, because she always had this fascination with statistics, she always wanted the biggest data set possible that she could use. Now, the biggest country in the world, or the most populated at the time, was China, but Britain had no influence there. So instead, India became what she considered the best place to actually gather data. 
The British, of course, it was part of their empire at the time, and Nightingale became increasingly concerned about the ideas of empire, and she saw it that Britain had no right to be there unless they were actually looking after the people, their subjects. That led to many, many clashes with both the government and Queen Victoria herself. And Nightingale had no hesitation in actually standing up for everybody, whether they were a British subject or a member of the empire, because really what she cared for was individuals and thought they deserved compassion. Mm. Throughout her life, she remained a campaigner for veterans' rights. My top right-hand image there shows a ceramic that was actually made um, towards the end of her life, which she endorsed in order that they were sold to still provide money for the soldiers of the Crimean War. And we've also got a voice recording at the museum, which again, she agreed to. It's one of the first voice recordings. It's lovely because it does put us really sort of in touch with her still, but she did it and only agreed to it if the money went to help her comrades from the Crimea, as she always referred to them. I've included a picture at the bottom left there of Sidney Herbert because Nightingale certainly set a new trend and almost became like a civil service for herself by the fact that she had influence over politicians. People will often criticise her because she clearly came from a wealthy background but I always push back and say it's amazing that someone that had the privileges that she did would put themselves through what she did for the sake of helping others. Being out in the Crimea, she had lice, she had all sorts of problems. Like I said, she caught brucellosis and she could easily, people begged her to go home, but she wouldn't. And then all she did was stay, collect the data, the information, and she had a 50 year campaigning career, which is why I think she's remembered so much because she didn't just go away and back to the easy life. She stayed and fought, and she used the statistics all the while in order to do so. It says a lot that she becomes um, one of the first women to be ordered the London Order of Merit, etc., and then upgraded to the national version shortly before her death. She got that one in 1907. There is a theory that by and that, which is three years before she passed away, she hadn't got the strength, the stamina left to argue that she just didn't want it. Because again, she wasn't always after being recognised, but by that point, perhaps she was just becoming that bit too frail. And certainly in her letters, we see at that point, they're now being written where she's dictating or her handwriting is very, very poor. Now, I've included a picture um, of Westminster Abbey, some of you I'm sure will recognise in the bottom, and that's because she was offered the opportunity to be buried there because she is a national heroine. And it speaks volumes that Nightingale wasn't at all interested in that. One of my favourite Florence facts is that she actually wanted her body to be donated to medical science, but at the time that was only suitable for criminals. So her family, again, got very, very upset with her and said, no, we can't have that. And so she eventually backed down and agreed to be buried in the family plot in what's pretty much an unmarked grave. I'll show you an image of later. But Westminster Abbey was certainly not for her, but I think it shows her status and how much she was thought of, because generally speaking, we're talking about members of the royal family and a few others. So Nightingale is an amazing character, and I'm bound to say that, of course, because I do actually work for the Florence Nightingale Museum. But I've been lucky enough in my career to have worked with some of the biggest names in British history. I've worked at places where a connection has been to Nelson, to Churchill, and to me, I genuinely do put her on that level. And to actually think that as a woman, she was achieving as much as what they did is phenomenal. You know, and she's absolutely ahead of her time. As with all historical characters, there's all sorts of stories. Some are true, some are not. You have to interpret for yourself. You have to look at the evidence. The top left there, I've put in the fact, you know, the angel of the Crimea. She certainly presented in many different ways as this quasi-religious figure who ultimately has given compassion to so many people. I think it's fair to say that some of the numbers that the people she treated are probably overestimated. 
Scutari Hospital, when it comes down to it, was huge and could cope with about 5,000 soldiers at any one time. Interesting enough, a similar size to one of the pop-up hospitals named in her name in the pandemic over here. But if you do the maths, there's just no way she could have actually walked around and seen as many people as it's claimed it was. But remember, the soldiers that were there were delirious, probably blinded um, a number by the what's happened and their injuries. And she insisted after she started the role that her nurses did the same thing. So if you're treated by a nice nurse who walks around with a lamp, it stands to reason that people are going to want to believe it's Florence because this whole myth develops around her. And what's really interesting is the candle, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but you can see it there on the image um, on the top right of the top right set. Other images that I've put in to actually show this very complex character, of course. Bottom left um, is something I found on the internet, and certainly Nightingale did have battles with her mental health when she came back from the Crimean War. I suspect, but I cannot diagnose because I'm not a doctor and she's not around for us to discuss it, but were there elements of post-traumatic stress? She'd gone from this very you know, privileged lifestyle to this absolute hell of Scutari, seeing these images, etc. It must have haunted her for you know the rest of her life, the pressure she was under. And remember, she hated the fame. She wanted to actually just get on with a job, whereas instead she's catapulted to being this national heroine. Top right again, um, a lot of people argue about what her role was in women's rights, because certainly some of her writings suggest that she's not necessarily advocating that every woman should have the power that she does to talk to politicians, etc. Um, but having said that, she was a suffragist. She paid her dues um, and wanted women to be able to vote. She just didn't spend her time going and chaining herself to railings and doing things some of the other suffragettes in the UK did partly because she was so busy writing letters. We estimate she wrote 15,000 campaigning letters during her life, which is pretty amazing, um, you know, when you actually look at it. I've included there a statue of somebody, it's a statue in the grounds of St. Thomas's, and it's somebody you may or may not have heard of, um, Mary Seacole, who was a Jamaican doctress um, of a Scottish father, Jamaican mother, and... Seacole travelled from Jamaica over to the UK to check her gold stocks she'd invested in during the Crimean War period. When she heard that Nightingale had gone to the Crimea, she wanted to go too. Now, it's often said that Nightingale turned her down. That isn't actually true, and it's quite a shame that that reputation emerges. But it is fair to say that the Nightingale office in London didn't forward her application because she ultimately wasn't able to provide the two references from gentry of the UK. And that's what Florence had stipulated she wanted. Now that leads to accusations of Florence being a snob, being classist. But I'd ask you all to remember at this point that one of the things Nightingale wants to do is lift that reputation of nursing and make sure that people, nurses, are respected and no longer the Mrs Gamp figure from Dickens. So that is why she insisted on the um, references. It's certainly untrue to say that Nightingale and Seacole had any animosity between each other. I understand from my research they met once for five minutes, were very civil, and then that was at Scutari where Seacole stopped on the way to the war front and then Seacole got on and just got on with her life and that's it. And it's a real shame, I think, that these two fantastic women are often pitted against each other when people are talking because actually I'm sure they respected each other. And then I finished that section with this picture. That is her grave down in the family plot in rural Hampshire. It's very difficult to access, takes a long drive, but you can see it's quite elaborate, but it's just got the letters FN. That's all she would allow to be put on it because in some ways she didn't want to be remembered. What she wanted as her legacy 
was for nursing to improve. And I think we'd all argue that that certainly happened. So the Florence Nightingale Museum, just a little bit about that. Um, unfortunately, it's difficult for you all to visit at the moment, but I hope that one day some of you will. But in the meantime, if you look at that web address there, that the end of 200 exhibits, you'll see the online version of our um, bicentenary exhibition. We did actually produce a version on site that's got most of the 200 and also a pop-up version that's traveling around hospitals in the UK. But, but as Fortune would have it, I always said that we'd do an online version, even pre-COVID. It was a masterstroke, obviously. But in reality, I wanted to do that because I remembered that Nightingale was largely housebound after the Crimean War and I wanted people to get an insight and I also recognise that she's a global figure and hugely popular throughout the world and thanks to the wonders of the World Wide Web check in on that and look at some of our exhibits. You can see we literally are right opposite um, the Houses of Parliament so if ever you're in London easy to find and we do a lot of work based around both history but also contemporary nursing and the bottom right hand corner there you'll see our family corner which we developed with the nursing team at St Thomas's Hospital and tell some of their stories about the legacy of Nightingale and the different roles that now exist within nursing. We're an independent charity, St Thomas's are our landlord and we've got about 3,000 items in our collection which we fondly call Nightingalia. About half of that is letters and pamphlets that Florence wrote, but even that's only a very small percentage of things that Florence would have actually um, written. They're in other collections literally around the world, but also the British Library, the Welcome Collection, some of the really big hitters in London. So really, um, what do we do? We tell a warts and all story. I never try and hide away from any of the things. Yes, she was a tough taskmaster. Yes, like all of us, she had her failings. She had her battles with mental health as well as her physical health. You know, when you read that document that reads like a school report, she was certainly very strict. And I wonder whether all her nurses would have liked her in the same way as a school teacher. But those that got on well with her, those that she developed relationships with, we see that they stay in touch for the rest of her life. She keeps offering guidance. People would write to her from throughout the world asking for advice on everything from hospital design to care systems. And I think she's also great at inspiring all sorts of people, not just within nursing and healthcare, but statistics and science, anyone with a disability when you think what she was able to achieve despite the injuries she sustained. For non-conformity she broke out of what's commonly referred to as the golden cage in Britain society for a woman to achieve what she did for a person who ultimately had a very different education and so on which I think we should be grateful to her father for. Even in her own lifetime, she was a female icon and that's amazing. But to this day, she's so respected in that way. There's three of our exhibits on the right hand side. I'd just like to have a think and a look for a moment or two. Being um, a person who spent their early career working with children, I always feel the need to put in some sort of quiz and interaction. So have a little look and I'll come back at the end and tell you what they are. But have a little look and try and guess for yourselves. You can write it in the chat if you'd like to. There's an easy one, a middle one and a hard one, typically, because, you know, I always think that's quite a fair way to be. Right, moving on swiftly on. This year was Nightingale's Bicentenary, as I said at the start, and that's indeed why I took this role. So I have to say, in some ways, COVID did actually cause some challenges to a programme I'd spent three years working on. But, you know, Nightingale had her challenges. I draw on her for inspiration. And I think what, you know, else could have been. The top photo is part of the Nightingale in 200 Objects exhibition that we put in. But like I said, fortunately, we had the online version that's received close to a million hits now. So do have a look and enjoy it. There's a nice little film in there with our actress we shot on location at her homes at Emberley and Lee Hurst. 
We'd also worked with Mattel to create Nightingale Barbie as part of their Inspiring Women series. And I included that to really reflect what an international name she is. And every year they create three special limited edition dolls. One from the field of science, which Nightingale is, one from the field of sport and one from the arts. And they do that, and that can be historical or contemporary figures, to actually show girls what they can be and what they can achieve. And I was really proud that we managed to actually convince them to do that in this particular year. I've included the shot of St Paul's because we were due in October to actually have a special service there, led by the Bishop of London, who, interestingly enough, is a former Nightingale nurse. And... The reason why we wanted to do that was partly as a free event that anyone could come to and it holds 5,000 people and partly because that's where Nightingale's official memorial service took place. Sadly, that was one of the events we lost due to COVID, um, but we're going to do it again next October. So if you're in London, October, November, keep an eye on our website. It's a good way of getting into St Paul's for free between you and I, but we won't tell anyone I said that. What you can do is come along to the even song, but keep an eye on our website, you might need to book a ticket. And the picture at the top, um, that's um, an event that we put on on the 12th of May as a direct response to the fact we lost other events. And actually in London, we were at the height of lockdown at that point. You needed permission to go out, etc., etc. And we did a projection from the museum across onto Parliament. And first, that was one of the slides, but the wording changed. You'll recognise the half Nightingale, half modern nurse image. We changed it to also thank um, our current nurses and carers. So it rotated onto that. It had uh, things. And we were also celebrating the fact that it's the year of nurse and midwife, which the World Health Organisation chose this year partly because it was Nightingale's bicentenary. So we put that together, believe it or not, in about five days. And what's really nice and why I'm really proud of it is that Parliament has never given permission for anyone to do that other than the Olympics in the UK. There's been a couple of people who've done it illegally, but I managed to get permission to do it. And I managed to do it because that's how respected Nightingale is. And it was a great site and it's nice to have the members. 2020, what relevance Nightingale has had. It's just amazing. I mean, you couldn't write this stuff. If it was in a film, you wouldn't believe it. But the year we spent planning um, in order that we'd have these special events, instead, I suppose nursing has had its own celebration. In the UK, because of the demand on hospitals, they decided to create some pop-up hospitals very similar to the pop-up hospitals that happened in the Crimean War. And they were all named Nightingale Hospitals. There was one at the Excel Trade Centre, but there was about five around the country. So that was a really nice tribute to her as well. Bottom um, left, may I say, every nurse ought to be careful to wash her hands. And that became such a mantra during the early days of COVID, where we're encouraging people and reminding people it's what Nightingale was talking about 150 you know, years ago. So it's fantastic to think that her legacy has helped in that way. I've put the picture again of one of her statistical diagrams because undoubtedly as we try and develop vaccines, as we try and actually think of the way forward out of this awful situation, it's Nightingale who actually said to us at the start, write down your observations, really record what is going on to make sure that we have the evidence. And so evidence-based nursing, as she called it, my word, how relevant is that now? And thanks again to Florence. I put that centre picture of the nurses celebrating where they saved somebody's life because certainly Nightingale said about, you know, every life is precious and that's what we should do. But I think that picture really sums up the camaraderie, the fact that they respect each other and it is a profession. And that is what she would have wanted. And we've got this quote here on the left where she said, it will take 150 years for the world to see the kind of nursing I envision. And as I say that, I've just shivered because it's so spooky that she said that 150 years ago. And now look what we're seeing. And 
you know, she wrote this great, one of the last great letters that she wrote before she became to her, where it was for a conference in Chicago. And she said, we're on the cusp of great things. We, you know, nursing is heading the way I want it to. And I think that's been proven. So our ambition in the future, presuming we do survive COVID, and it's a tough time for small charities in the UK, I'm sure it is for Germany too, is actually to become the Florence Nightingale Museum of International Nursing, expanding the stories we tell of other people and really celebrating her legacy. Before COVID, we were doing about 50,000 visitors a year. I predicted we'd do 70,000 this year because of the uplift. Clearly, that hasn't happened because we've been closed for 200 days. But that's our ambition in the future, and I'm very much hoping that we can do it to deliver for Florence, even though I think in some ways she'd be a little bit embarrassed us talking about her. If you've enjoyed me actually talking today and you'd like to find out more, please do visit our shop because we've got some great books about us. Some of them are, you know, a real bargain and yeah, it'll be a nice way to actually find out more. Do get in touch with me if you've got any questions or if you'd like to make a donation, feel free to do so. But of course, I need to answer those questions because I'd hate to have any family arguments going on about what those three things are. The top one is Florence's lamp and it's a Turkish fanous. So therefore all those pictures you see of her holding a candle or a genie lamp are wrong. And that's simply because whilst there was journalists on the ground in the Crimea, there weren't any photographers. And therefore they sent the story back Nobody in the UK had ever seen a lamp like that, so they just drew a candle. And that just shows how easy it is for history to be wrong and presented wrong. It's one of my favourite parts of the story, and I'm really proud that we've got the lamp that was in her office in our museum. The second one, um, you'll see our curator holding it there, because it's something we work a lot with children with. It's a Qatari sash. I'm sure you've all seen Miss World. Nightingale introduced that as Qatari Hospital. And it wasn't, in, all, in a way, it's just the opposite when I make the Miss World reference. It's because, actually, she wanted to make sure that none of the soldiers were fraternising with her soldiers, uh, with her ladies, and she wanted to identify them. It's widely regarded as the first piece of nursing uniform, and so that's why it's special, designed by Florence. And the final one, the tough one, that's what's known as the Shakes pillow. And it's one of Florence's personal items that she was given and used. When she went to Egypt, as one of the first Western women to go there, she met a number of princes and one of the Arab princes gave her that, recognising that women should have good posture and that's what suited a lady. And so we've got that and it's um, a mystery item in our collection. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, very much appreciate um, you giving me the time to talk about something I'm so passionate about. And have you got any questions? Well, thank you very much, David. This has been extraordinarily interesting and we've certainly all learned um, a great deal. Um, I, was, I was quite um, fascinated by, by your talking about um, her time in Germany. And I sort of started thinking about it um, I would presume that in um, UK or in England, um, nursing somehow dropped because Henry VIII got rid of the monasteries and, and the nunneries, of course. So there were no longer any nuns who could actually care about people. Whereas in Germany and in, yes. on the continent in general, um, even after the Reformation, nunneries were still there. So there was a sort of long-standing tradition, in a way, of, 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 of nursing. And so uh, it doesn't really surprise one that, that um, Florence Nightingale went to Germany and, and, and probably to other countries too, to, to see what, what, there was, what, what there was there, actually, in, in, in the way of a nursing tradition and, and, and picked it up from that. That's actually a very um, and virtually unknown sort of aspect um, aspect to that. Um, I mean, she must have been, that's the other thing, she, she must have been an absolute pain in the neck to her family. Because, um, I mean, every time they thought, you know, she, they'd sort of half sort of reined her in in a certain way, 
There she was, shooting off again with something. I mean, it was 17 years that she wanted to be a nurse for. Um, she's sitting yeah. in a tree at Emberley, yeah. and she's 16, nearly 17. It just, it just shows. 34 you know, by the time she does quite, it. Quite determined and, 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 um, and yes, courageous if you, want to, if you want to achieve something in, in life, and you shouldn't sort of be taken in by your own, um, by your own family too much. Um, tell me one thing. Wasn't she sort of quite close to a German diplomat in, in, in London who later was quite influential in starting a German hospital in London, which existed, I think, till, oh, fairly recently, till, till the 1970s or 1980s or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, can't, I, I can't remember his name, but there was somebody whom she was sort of in touch with, wasn't there? Florence's um, connections are just absolutely amazing. And mm -hmm. in the little exhibition that we put on for this year, it's quite interesting because we've got the door knocker from South Street, which was her house that she lived in for 50 years. The house isn't there anymore. It was bombed during the war, but the door knocker had been retrieved. So we've mounted it on a door. And on that door, as you enter that part of the exhibition, we've got a list of people who visited her at, House, at South Street to seek her advice, to get her approval and endorsement on things. And it's ambassadors, it's, you know, you name it. You know, they are the mm. great and the good of the day, I suppose we would call them. And that's from Germany, from Italy. Um, the Aga Khan visited her. You know, it's just phenomenal who this list is it even includes royalty because because one of the ways in which she was quite challenging is that if she didn't want to see somebody she just wouldn't and um, and that meant therefore she wouldn't go to them so royalty might have wanted or, or the prime minister like gladstone might have wanted her to comment on something recognizing it would be an endorsement but the only way to get her on side sometimes was actually to turn up and doorstep her mm -hmm even then hope that the maid didn't send you away. Yeah. I mean, in modern language, one would call her a civil society activist in a way. Yes, just, very much. I mean, uh, she uh, is a campaigner. And, 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 and um, um, believed in her, in her mission. Now, I do want to invite the audience to um, put some questions or comments in the chat room. There's, um, there's someone. Um, ah. I can, I can just read it out. Thank you very much for your talk, indeed. Can you give one or two interesting examples how Nightingale collected her statistics and how conclusions were drawn from it for hospital or nursing routines? This is from Dresden asking. Certainly. Um, she often relied on data from other people, um, purely because at the point she's bedridden, she's not out there, but she would make a point of asking for it. So I think the, a really good example was the, one of the ones that I put up there was about what was killing the soldiers that were out in India, in the empire. And if you have a look at that, she breaks it down to show that sometimes it's water, sometimes it's sexually transmitted diseases, very occasionally, it's actually gunshots and things you'd, so you'd associate with being a soldier. So certainly that was one really good example of how she campaigned and got a better. She also did the same for um, Indian famine victims. Like I said, she's, she cares about individuals. So even though in a way her interest started with the army, she became interested in the Indian subjects as well. And it was just viciously argued with Parliament that, you know, if we're in their country, we've got to look after people. If not, we're not doing the civilising that, you know, is the name of the empire. The other really good example, I think, and where she would change her mind was that she did some, um, quite a lot of data work regarding maternity hospitals. And in the end, after collecting all the statistics, she actually decided women were safer to give birth at home. And she became a real advocate for home birth because she just realised that the hygiene in hospitals still wasn't at the standard that she wanted. So she had people out there collecting all this data for her. And remember, this is a pre-calculator era. She just spent ages going through it. And, 
you know, how anyone had the patience to do it is personally beyond me, but there you go, we're all different and I'm very grateful that she did. Thank you. Any more comments from the floor in the chat room? No, that, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, it was very comprehensive. Then let me put one more. Um, in a way, it's quite surprising that within a very few years, there was Florence Nightingale um, in, in, the, in the Crimean War, and there was Henri Dunant in um, the um, uh, war between France and Austria. Um, and they ended up with seeing the same uh, problem, but, um, but with fairly different solutions. Do you have any background to that? Not hugely. Um, I think that one of the things that it's always remembering, and one of the ways in which some ways, if I draw a parallel, was it's quite interesting that Florence's stance on the formation of the Red Cross organisation, in the, that at first she was quite supportive of the idea, and then she changed her mind because she actually became very concerned that mm -hmm. governments didn't take responsibility for their subjects. They'd go into war and not really think of the consequences. And she felt that that charitable angle was, whilst it was good, and so she at first encouraged it and she actually donated money to it, she actually moved away from the idea. And... I think that the thing that it's really, you know, that really runs through for Orance is that she's a deep thinker. She's not afraid to make a U-turn as more evidence emerges. But golden thread that is always there is compassion. And it's often compassion for the ordinary person as well. If I'm honest, within the Crimean War, and a slight difference between her and Seacole is that Seacole was very much looking after the officer classes because she was there as a businesswoman. Whereas Nightingale is very <laughs> the standard soldier and making sure she can look after them. And, you know, she stays in touch with them till her dying day. It's part of the reason, again, where things like the Chelsea Hospital and things like that. And why she was so loved because she just wanted to look after the ordinary man in the street. Mm. So here we have a very straight question from Renate Kinsinger. So, France, uh, Florence Nightingale never got married. Yeah. Um, was she ever, um, I mean, were there ever thoughts of her getting married or something? Um, she had three proposals. Um, and Richard Monkton Milnes, the chap I had the picture of, it's thought that, you know, she did consider it because he was very, very liberal for the time. And therefore, she quite liked that. Intellectually, they were on the same level, um, I think it would be fair to say. So she thought, yeah, you know, I can get the mental stimulus that I need from him. But she just realised that it would bring him such embarrassment if she were to want to work for a living. And, and why work? I don't mean paid work. Even when she worked at Harley Street, her father paid it because she couldn't take the money because that would have been culturally wrong. So that was the um, so that was one example. The other, um, the two other proposals that we know of. One was one of her second cousins, and she said no straight away, but kept in touch with the chap. He asked her again, and it actually caused quite a family rift in the fact that you know was she leading him on and stuff whereas you know generally i think it's thought that she just wasn't interested but wanted to let him down quite gradually the third one was actually lord Verney, who um again saw her as a good match i think liked the fact she'd got a bit of oomph and um she was quite a feisty um lady perhaps he saw her as a bit of a challenge and um but Interestingly enough, he ended up managing, uh, marrying her sister, Parthenope. Um, and I always feel quite sorry for Parthenope, the fact that, you know, she ends up with a sort of cast off. Almost. But in reality, that relationship worked well. And Nightingale was great friends with him. But 
she ultimately put her work first and I guess perhaps being so close and having studied alongside nuns and the like she could see the you know almost being married to the job it's one of the reasons why sometimes the modern profession aren't keen on used at being used as an icon because of course now we want people to have family relationships she was very close to a lot of her you know her family and so on it has been suggested you know questions have been raised regarding her sexuality and so on but just because she didn't get married but i've actually seen no real evidence for that in her writings as such i think that that's purely speculation because it's so exceptional to not get married at that time easy thing to band around and then a piece of satirical literature came out a few years after her death that suggested that her and Queen Victoria were interested in each other and that gave more momentum to that but that was just a piece of you know fantasy satire writing but it just shows once something's out there people develop their own story to suit their argument. Thank you there's one more here from Beverly Mubar would like to know are there any family members today and what happened to the nightingales homes and fortune right um that's a lovely question clearly she didn't marry so she didn't have children so there's no direct descendants um etc what there are is um a number of cousins at the time um the nightingale family whilst her parent she only had one sister you know one of two children that she had about 15 cousins and so going down the different lines um there are people around today um who are direct you know blood relationships as in on her you know, so um there's a chap called john shawcross who's a big supporter of the museum he's a solicitor who lives down in the hampshire area just a stone's throw from Embley, and he's probably the second closest the person that you're likely to have heard of the actress Helena Bonham Carter and those of you who are fans of the Harry Potter franchise of films um, she is a distant cousin as well um, etc the Bonham Carters were linked in that way so in that way but it they are distant relatives it's not like anyone can say she was my great grandma because she didn't have the children regarding the homes um, Embley Park in Hampshire is now a boarding school um so that's a lovely place to go to school like i said if you have a look on our website at the little film in the 200 exhibits section we shot most of it at Embley, so you can see that um lovely relationship the museum has got with them um this time last week i was sitting doing their annual prize giving via zoom because i was meant to be going and giving a talk but sadly i couldn't Lee Hurst up in Derbyshire, which if I'm honest, as nobody from Embley is listening to this talk, I'll say was probably her favourite home, because um, it was that bit smaller, a bit more intimate. It's now in private hands, owned by a gentleman called Peter Kay. Um, amazingly, he didn't have an interest in Nightingale when he bought it. Um, he just bought it because... It was a nice house overlooking the Peak District, one of the beautiful areas of the UK. But he's become a real Nightingale fan. And he's actually started collecting all sorts of bits and bobs to do with her. And, um, you know, he's very interested. The other properties, South Street, where she lived for 50 years when she came back to the UK, like I said, was sadly destroyed and so on. The other place that's got a big connection to her, um, in a way, because it was Lord Verney and her sister Parthenope's house, is Claydon House, which is in Buckinghamshire, about an hour and a half outside London. A big stately home. The Verneys are one of the old families of the UK that are landed gentry. That's why her mother was so keen to marry into them and why Parthenope then got married off when Florence said no. And um, the Verney family are very proud of their connection, recognising that they married in, so to speak. And um, I recently loaned them Florence's carriage from the Crimean, where when she went to visit the battlefront, 
-hmm. Originally, she tried to go around on a mule, but she fell off it. So they made her a carriage out of a Russian peasant's wagon and some other bits. That's part of the museum collection. Um, and I can't get it on display. They've got a lovely stable yard. So I lent them it and it's on display up there. So they're around and I still talk to the Verney family. Yeah. Right. Um, I can't see any more questions here. Um, Nick Jeffcott from from Frankfurt says many thanks to David for his excellent talk. Uh, so that's um, what we would all say, I think, at this point. Thank you very, very much indeed. It's been very informative and, and um, very comprehensive. Um, we now all know very much more about Florence Nightingale, and we can promise you that um, if ever, what with COVID-19 and Brexit and <laughs> couple of other hurdles we will ever be able to go to London again we will come and see you at St Thomas's Hospital. Very much well do ask for me um, we're only a small um, site etc and I will hopefully get out to Germany at some point because certainly always a special place particularly at this time of year. Okay so thank you very much indeed and just for um, people who've joined us tonight I just want to remind you that our